Okay, Julia Neiman here for Monetize Your Passion Academy, and I'm here with Shamika Tankerson today. Thanks for being here, Shamika. Thanks, I'm Julia. Who you are, and then we're going to get into this great conversation. So, Shamika is a master sales strategist. She's an international best selling author, award winning business coach who's been featured on ABC, CNN, CBS, and Forbes. That's pretty impressive. She's creator of Authority Selling Method, which is a powerful yet simple framework for having conversations and making offers that serve and sell. Shamika empowers high performance business leaders all over the globe to bust through fear, boldly acknowledging the massive value they bring to the table and activate 100% confidence to charge more and sell more without apology. And I need this talk as much as anybody else. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. And we're, I'm super excited to have you. So Shamika, talk to us. What does this mean about, you know, activating 100% confidence to charge more? What does it mean to sell without apology? Well, people think that sales, like there's the stigma around sales based on, you know, the slimy person, used car salesman, um, you know, they're money hungry and only after your money and they're going to do something bad to you. And so what I am aiming to do is to shift people's perspective about what actually happens during a conversation with someone where you're selling so that we remove all of that and they understand that it's a, a very powerful um, connection. It's a very powerful point in the, in the timeline of the, both the person who is selling and the person who is being sold to. And so in order to activate 100% sales confidence, you have to release all of that. It's, it's all about who you be. It's not really about the scripts or the strategy um, or overcoming objections because I don't really believe you can overcome anybody's objection to wanting to buy from you, um, but you can partner with them in the decision-making process. And so that's one of the things that I teach, but that's really what this is about. This is about you being 100% confident in showing up to support someone and making a decision and not really thinking about and letting go of the outcome and not really thinking about, you know, whether what they're thinking about you. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I know for me, that was a big one too. And it took a long time for me to get there. You know, part of that, I think, though, has to do with a lot of limiting beliefs we have about ourselves and about money in general. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I had, I always had, I have a lot of confidence in myself, but I always had a hard time asking people for money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a big one for me. And uh, I don't know that I'm all the way there yet, but <laughs> I'm working on it. And that's the beauty of it. You know, with being an entrepreneur, you just, it's a go for it thing. You just go for it. And the more you do it, the better you get. Right. So yeah. what we're talking here, a lot of the, um, our listeners here are um, brand new to business. They don't know the first thing about selling. And that's a big question for them. It's like, how am I going to do this? I can set up a business, but you know, what do I need to develop in myself and, and how do I get to be confident? Yeah. So I'm going to back up, like most people will just jump right in and say, this is how you have a sales conversation. And I want to back up, Julie, I want to back up to who do you need to become in order to sell more? Mm -hmm. and who do you need to become in order to charge more? That's really what it's about. It's not like, Shamika, what do I need to do? It's who do I need to become? And so I like to talk about the positions or the posture or the way that you can be in a sales conversation. And there's three different positions that I talk about. And I'm going to teach you guys this right now. So if you don't have a pen, grab a pen. <laughs> um, but I'm going to teach you the three positions in a sales conversation. Now, here's the deal. Only one of these positions is actually the powerful position that you can be in that will allow you to activate 100% confidence in yourself. And then maybe a little bit later on, we'll play a little game and we'll do something, uh, a little activity to show you how to activate that confidence awesome. before you ever get on a sales conversation or a call. So those three positions. So the first position is the validator. So when you show up as a validator, what's happening inside of you is your value system or how you're trying to prove your worth investing in or that your service is worth people buying or whatever you're selling is worth it, is you're telling them, I have all these credentials. 
So you're just talking and talking and talking about your company and how long they've been in business and how many degrees you have. And like, like me, like valid, validate me, like, look at me. I'm worth investing in because I have all of these credentials. Here's my long list of all the proof of why you should buy from me. And so most of the time you will notice that you're in this position. If you're talking, talking, talking about yourself, all the time throughout the sales conversation and you will totally obliterate your sales. You will get more no's than often, more often than not, because what's people's most favorite thing to talk about? Themselves. So, so let your clients talk about themselves instead of you talking about yourself. You want to be the most amazing listener in the world. So the validators value system again is I'm worth it because I've got all of these credentials, right? So what you're trying to prove is that you're trustworthy. So the value system is trust me, I'm worth it. Um, and you'll find that you're in that position if you're talking, talking, talking about yourself and not listening to the client. So that's the validator. And a lot of times, if you do have a business, you'll notice if your business is taking this validator position in a sales, when it comes to sales, because you might be having um, little taster options. So you have this idea that if I sell somebody something for a little bit of money and then they get to try it out, right? They get to try it first. And then once they try it out, you move them to the next level and the next level and the next level and, and the next level that you're trying to validate yourself. And while that may work in sales and it may work in some product-based businesses and different things, it's the slow road to actually creating the most amount of revenue in your business. It takes time to do that. All right, second one. Ready? That was great. So the second one is the best friend, or let's just call it the BFF. Let's use some, some acronyms, okay? So the BFF. So if you're showing up to your conversation as the BFF, your value system is like me. I'm worth it. So you're proving that your product or service or you're worth them buying from if they like you. Now, what you'll notice in both of these positions that aren't very powerful is the number one caveat is you're talking, 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 and not doing enough listening. But if you're taking the BFF stance, what you're talking about mostly, Julia, is you're talking about, you're talking because you want to get to know them and you want to be their friend and you want them to like you. And so you might ask a lot of questions about their family and like all kinds of things. And you're, you're trying to prove that you're likable because you think you know that there's this thing out there called the no like trust factor. And everyone says that if we build our no like trust factor, then people will buy from us. And so you're spending your time on the conversation trying to get them to like you and like you and like you. And so you're talking, talking, talking and over talking and being their friend. Here's the problem with being in this position more often than not. In this position, when it comes time to tell the truth to somebody in a sales conversation, because the truth is what's going to set them free and allow them to make the real decision, you can't do it because you're too worried about them liking you. You're more concerned with whether or not they will still like you when the conversation is over than if they make a decision that is actually going to change their life or impact their future or impact their family or their health. And you know, I, I can see what would happen with that. You want them to like you so much that when you get around to telling them the price, you're, you're like thinking in the back of your head, oh my God, are they going to like me when yes. I tell them how much this is? Yes. Hesitation comes out in your voice and then they're like, mm, I'm not quite sure I want to do that. Or you second guess yourself with your pricing and you go, okay, I want them to really like me. So I'm going to give them a deal. And you're always changing your pricing structure and cutting yourself out where you have no profit, right? So yeah, we don't want to take that BFF stance and we don't want to take that valid validator stance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I can really see where I've been in both of those positions before. Me too. All right. So <laughs> what now is the best position, the most powerful? So the most powerful position that you want to take in your sales conversation is actually the authority positioning. Now, I want you to think about this. This is not about lording over someone. This is about leading them. 
right? We're not convincing people, we're not pushing them, we're not forcing them, but we are guiding and leading. So the authority's value system is, is simply this. It is diagnose the situation and prescribe the solution. So here's how I want you to think about this authority positioning. Um, and I'll go back to something I really want you to take to heart before you get on a conversation to try to sell something to someone. So in an, in, as the authority that's diagnosed and prescribed, I want you to think about a doctor, okay? When you go to a doctor, you trust that they have your best interests at heart. And they're not saying, hey, look at my credential on the wall, right? They're not saying that. What the, when you go in there, you already know that they are the person who is going to tell you how to cure whatever ailment it is that you have. And so when you take this authority position, what you're doing is you're saying to, in confidence to the prospect or the person that's on the other end of the phone or the other, other end of the desk that you're selling to, that I am a person that you can trust to guide you to what's in your best interest. So now I'm no longer trying to prove what's going on because here is something I want you to take to heart. If someone agrees to have an appointment with you, they already believe that you have a solution to their problem. You're no longer proving that. You are not auditioning for America's Got Talent or American Idol, like that doesn't even exist anymore. You're not auditioning for a variety show. They have come to you because they believe you have something that can solve their problem already. So if you take this authority positioning as the doctor, the doctor asks you questions, right, about what's going on in your body. They listen to you. And then you say something, they might, they might think of something else. Oh, you said this. So what about this? Are you sensing this? Because they get an idea. Like if you say my elbow hurts, oh, well, do you feel anything numbness in your hand, right? It leads every answer you give because they're listening intently and writing it down, leads them to a different kind of question. And from that question, they gather enough information so that they are able to tell you when they get to the end of this conversation, here's the best course of action. So I've been listening to you and it sounds like this is your problem. And here's what I believe we should do. I'm going to write you a prescription for X. That's how you have your conversations. You listen and you let what they're saying guide you to get more discovery by asking more questions, right? Once you di have diagnosed that problem based on asking those questions, you prescribe a solution. So here's what I'm hearing, Julia. What I'm hearing is as we're talking, you're saying this is the problem. And the course of action that I believe that you should take is this. Totally different position than buy my stuff. Please buy my stuff. Right? We have the best. We have the best. <laughs> wow. That, you can see how that's really powerful because I, it's like, okay, I've been listening to you. I know exactly what's going on. Here it is. You're reflecting back to me. That's a, a skill that we need to learn is reflection. Yes. So you're reflecting back to me what you heard me say, or basically you actually knew before the conversation started, because if you, if I didn't, if I wasn't nervous about sales or didn't need help with sales, I wouldn't have come to you in the first place. Yes. So you kind of knew where I was coming from before we even started the conversation. You were able to reflect that back to me and I'm going, this woman really knows who I am. Exactly. exactly. And I really want to work with her. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is really powerful. So before anything, how you show up and who you are being in the conversation, that makes the most difference. It's not what script you use or what you say and in what order you say things. It's how you show up. You can't show up needy and nervous and scared, like trust that the person on the other end is seeking guidance from you as an expert, as an authority in what you do, because they don't have knowledge in what you do. They have knowledge about their life and what's going on with them, but they are not the expert. You are. And they're there with, for you, with you, in front of you, or on the phone with you for that guidance. Yeah, that's a good one. So how does somebody just starting out who's never really done sales before, although I like to joke with some of my, my clients, my younger clients, because, you know, they did some things on the street, they <laughs> negotiated for some things and sold some things that maybe not, but they have that skill. Yeah. They have that experience. So I always tell them, okay, so 
maybe that wasn't, you know, the, the most uh, positive experience, but you have the experience. Let's take that skill. How did that work for you? Let's, you know, let's take all the negative out of it and look at how that worked and then move forward from there. How can you use that? So, so two things. I'm, I'm hoping that by you being a part of this training that um, you are getting the experience that sales isn't a negative thing before right. you ever get started because it's not. Yeah. And, and I didn't mean the sale was negative. I meant the situation. You know, if you're selling drugs to somebody on the street, that's not exactly. No, that's not. Positive right. experience. Right. That's exactly. That's, that's exactly right. And that's what I want everybody to look at. It, it may have not been the most positive or legal experience, but yeah. you have this experience. You know, I know somebody the other day we did an interview with, and uh, he didn't say this on the call, but he was selling uh, speakers out of the back of a truck at one point in time, you know, and that wasn't exactly legal and he didn't get caught, but he made a lot of money and it helped him moving forward because he, yeah. he was able to build on those, that experience, you know? So, um, so yeah. So, okay. So, okay. So I'm starting for nothing. You know, I never did sales, not a day in my yeah. life. And then suddenly I'm in a position of having to sell. Well, well I want to start with three, three things that you really need to understand. So the first thing is this, I promise you you're already a salesperson and you have been since the day you were born. So listen, Okay. when you were born, right? You came out of the womb, you started crying and somebody either gave you a bottle or they picked you up. That's right. That was your first sale. <laughs> You've been selling since you exited the womb. Okay. Since you were a baby, you've been selling stuff. You've been selling your ideas to your parents. Please, 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 mom, I want to go to Disneyland, right? You, <laughs> you've been selling That's since right. the day you were born. In That's school, I mean, everybody, let's go play this game instead of this game. You are a natural born salesperson. That's so I want you to remember way. that. That's a great way to look at it. I never looked at it like that before. Awesome. Um, the second thing that I want you to think about, so you're a natural born salesperson is the first thing. I'm like, I totally forgot what I was going to say about the second thing I was going to tell you guys. It was something that was really good. Okay. So we're just starting out in sales. Um, so at the beginning of your conversations, well, let's not even go into conversations. So here's what I want you guys to realize. Sales is just you facilitating a decision for somebody else. They are at point A. They want to get to point Z. They're at the beginning of the alphabet. They want to get to the end of the alphabet. There is a huge gap, right, between A and Z. Yeah. You are just showing them that what you have fills that gap. That's all you're doing. You're facilitating that decision that I have something that helps you get from where you are at point A to point Z. That is simply what this conversation is about. You are a facilitator of the decision. You are guiding them in the, the decision. And what you are, what you must do is let go of the outcome. What do I mean by that? If you don't let go of the outcome, you will find yourself as the BFF or the validator because the outcome, if it's connected to you, if their yes means you're great and their no means you suck, right? No. Then you're attached and you'll start to jump into validating and trying to be their friend so that they'll like you because you think that their yes or no is saying whether or not they like you. Their yes or their no is just their yes to whatever is at their yes or no to whatever is at point Z. Has nothing to do with you. So if you can release their outcome and give it back to them and not take ownership of it, as if they say no, they're saying no to me, my feelings are hurt, my stuff sucks, I did something wrong, then you will be much better off in the conversation. So release the outcome, let go of the outcome of yes or no. We don't really care whether or not they say yes or no. What we care about is that they make a decision. And, and in reality, they're not saying no to you, they're saying no to themselves. Yes, or whatever it is they want. Whatever that big vision is, whatever it is that dream is, whatever it is that, you know, the ailment that they're having that you can solve, that's what they're saying no to. They're saying, no, I don't want to solve that problem right now. They're not saying, no, Shamika, you suck, or no, Julia, you suck. And, and likewise, when they say yes, they're not saying, yes, you're the greatest. 
Yeah. They're saying yes to themselves. They're saying yes to what they desire. They're saying yes to allowing you to guide them from point A to point B. That's it. That's awesome. And, and that's, it starts out then that authority relationship then starts out with them already respecting you. Yes. And not questioning their decision to say yes. They already have confidence in you and they're going to be more receptive to what you have to tell them. And they're going to be more participatory and they're going to get more out of it. And then at the end of it, they're going to say, you were amazing. And I can't wait to tell all my friends about you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's a great approach. I, I've been taking notes. <laughs> that is a great approach. I really like that. So when I look at the academy here, mm -hmm. what we have is like, okay, you have an idea, you have a dream for your life. What we have is the ability and the people to help you to, to show you the skills you need to, to help you develop that and to help you take that step from idea all the way to implementing and starting that business. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically all it's about. It's like, if I come to you and I'm saying, I want to be a part of this academy and here's my dream, you know, I want to start this kind of business and I want it to reach these people and I want it to make this difference in the world. You are the, 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 the bridge from the idea and the passion that they have in their heart to actually bringing that to pass, bringing it to fruition, bringing it into the world, birthing it because without it, they can't get there. They might, right? But we're allowing them to cut the line because we're giving them access to cutting edge instructors and knowledge and wisdom that have taken most of us decades to cultivate. You're getting it right now. That's awesome. So Shamika, how do you actually bring people, there's people you're talking to, maybe you're doing a training or you're on a webinar or tell us, tell us something like this. How do you actually bring people into the sales conversation? Mm -hmm. Um, that's one of the things I deal with with my clients a lot is just looking at the world as one big, big networking event and all of the focus, um, you know, is on how can I get people into conversations and you just quite frankly invite them. You just invite them. You just say, hey, I'd love to continue this conversation. So let's say I'm at a networking event. It's usually loud, right? It's loud. There's lots going on. And people, you, you can tell when someone's intrigued about you, they'll start to ask questions. How do you do that? Oh, tell me more about that. And you can just quite simply say, it's kind of loud in here. You know, I'd love to continue this conversation. Do you have time next week? Maybe I can, we can put a date on the calendar right now. So that's one way. Um, and in, in using social media, I look at social media as one big networking party. <laughs> That's all. We're, it's a party. We're networking, right? Wow. So what I notice and I, what I take notice of is when I post about my business or when I post about what I'm doing in the world or my client success stories, who are the people that continuously like my post and comment on my post? What they're doing is secretly raising their hand saying, I'm watching you and I'm very interested in what you're saying. And so over time, or even quite quickly, if I notice what they comment, you know, is something that's like, right now, I have an interest in this, I'll send them a message in their inbox and say, hi, hello, it's like networking. Hey, I've, I've noticed that you, you know, you commented on my post or whatever. And I, I really believe XYZ is true. Just have a conversation. Not, I noticed you commented on my post. Want to get on my calendar? <laughs> Do that. That's yeah. a little creepy, right? Yeah. So we're not going to that extent. Um, unless it's somebody I know, like if I know them very well, I'm like, Hey, we need to talk, just get on my calendar and then I'll send them a link. So I'm just very direct, but just engage with them. Like you would at a networking event. So tell me like, what are you, what's up for you in your business right, right now? What's going well? What's, you know, just ask them a question like you would if you were standing right in front of them and then they will share. That's a good one. So engage, you're saying to engage them, ask them a question, bring them in. Yes. And they get the feeling that, okay, you really want to hear what's yes. going on with me and I'm going to tell you. Right. And then you're using, I'm sorry, you're using your good listener skills. Yes. Then you are stepping forward as the authority. Yes. And if this conversation keeps going back and forth, then you can do the same thing you would in the live networking event and say, I love having this conversation. Would you be open to jumping on a quick call with me to, to further discuss it? Because we're in messenger right now or whatever the case may be. I'd love to jump on a quick call. And now you've got them on your calendar. Smart. That is really good. That's so, so being a good salesperson, part of that is being clever. 
and recognizing opportunity to invite people in and you have to keep inviting people. So let's, let's say this, cause I don't think it's about being clever. It's about being honest more than anything. Okay. And knowing that when you can help somebody, you're not doing them, you're not, you're not doing them a favor if you don't offer or invite for them to take the next step with you. Because what that's, that's like you having the cure to cancer and saying, I'm so worried about how you're going to judge me for wanting to sell to you that I'm not going to tell you this cure. I'm not going to invite you to talk to me about it. Right. Because you do have a cure. You have a cure to whatever problem that you solve. They're looking for it. And because you might be afraid of how they might judge you or being rejected or, you know, how they might look at you, you don't say, hey, let's have a conversation or you don't make an offer to them. That's actually being more selfish than not selfish because you're leaving them in their problem when you know you have a solution to it. So it's not really about being clever. It's about being caring. Right. And listening, because I'm still listening and I'm paying attention paying attention. So I think the big, the best salespeople actually have the biggest hearts because they care enough about people to make the, those invitations to them, to ask for the sale, to invite people to work with them, to invite people into conversations, to share with them how they can support them on their journey. That's awesome. So does this work for, I'm not quite sure in my mind how this works for everything. Like if you're selling a product, like, <laughs> I, I had a client, you know, uh, one of my main stories that I tell is a client that wanted to be a professional skateboarder. And he, um, y- you know, he had to learn those skills. He didn't have the skills. And in the meantime, he was an artist as well. And so he did a lot of skateboarding art. And we sold, I helped him sell some things to the skateboarding manufacturer. They customized skateboards with it. And then he got into doing um, silk screening designs. So how do you sell that kind of thing. I mean, it's still the same thing as listening to the clients. If we go with skateboarding, like, why do you want to skateboard? Why is it important to you? What happens a lot of times when we sell, we try to sell people, sell to people for our reasons and people don't buy for our reasons. They buy for theirs. Well, we're selling, we're, I'm sorry, we're selling to the manufacturer of the skateboard. So, um, would you say, ask him the same questions? Like, what are your questions? So go back. Maybe I missed something. So you're selling to the manufacturer. What are you selling? A design? design. Okay. So same thing. I mean, it's, it's, if they're looking for designs, it's what are you looking for and why? What's important to you about that? And what would that mean to your company? So it's the same type of thing. It's, it's, it's where are they? What's the struggle? Why is that important? Why now? That kind of thing. You're just asking the same sorts of questions and listening because they're going to have a reason. And the same thing stands you're not going to sell to that um, manufacturer for your reasons. They're not going to buy for your reasons. They're going to buy for theirs. And so your job as a salesperson is to find out what their reasons are. That's great. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I hear a lot of people talking about sales and there's a lot of sales trainers out there and they talk about having a system and following a step-by-step thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't, you I, I don't hear you talking about that yours is really just inviting people in asking them questions listening and reflecting back to them and then saying this is what i offer you so i truly believe that you do need to have a, re- a, a repeatable process or a repeatable structure or frame oh, so good. that you're not just shooting off the cuff when you're having these conversations and they don't just last a long time and go all over the place And that framework doesn't need to be scripted necessarily, but it should follow helping the method that will allow someone to make a decision. When we make a decision as human beings, our brain has certain questions that kind of come up. And so if you can just follow a simple framework that makes sure that you cover all of that. So the first one is like, who are you and why should I buy from you, right? Why should I trust you? And so you're immediately, the first thing you want to do in your conversation is connect with them so that that no like trust factor does go up. And that first, the first way to, or the best way to connect with somebody to, to build the no like trust factor very quickly is to find common ground. That's it. Find, don't make up common ground. Don't be weird about it. Don't try like, oh, we both have red shirts on or whatever. Don't do that. But find some commonality. You know, we both have 
Um, we both live in the same neighborhood. We both have children, you know, um, I love chocolate, you love chocolate, that kind of thing. Um, so that will require you to do a little bit, re little bit of research on your clients before you have conversations sometimes, or a little bit of diving into that stuff and shooting the breeze at the very beginning of the conversation so that you can find common ground. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and Google is your friend because you yes. know people and yes. all of their online stuff comes up and yes. you can see what they're posting on social media. It's a, yeah. Exactly. yeah. I spend at least a couple of minutes on people's social media profiles before I get on, just before I get on the phone so I can see what's actively happening in their life today right now. Yeah. And it's not like creeper stalker kind of thing, guys. That's not what I'm talking about. You don't want to be like, oh, so you were at your mom's house yesterday. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> but if you can say, well, um, you know, they say, oh, I just have a dog. I don't have children. And you're like, yeah, I saw that you have a whatever kind of dog. You have a collie, you know, I'm not really into dogs, but my cousin has a collie, <laughs> you know, um, whatever. Just finding some common ground very quickly automatically boost no like trust factor yeah they feel a connection to you you're yeah. um, so you do want to do that first because that connection helps now you can be the authority and guide and lead them because there is this sense of you know this person is sort of like me yeah and if you can't find any commonality if they're like selling a product can you comment on that and create a connection that way yeah. I give kudos all the time. So I'll go and I'm like, man, you are rocking it in the social media world or just whatever. You know, I love what you're up to in the world or whatever you see, just whatever it is, just make sure it's genuine and honest. Don't make up stuff because you're like, okay, Shamika said that we need to find common ground. So that plant in your background is amazing. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> so be genuine and heartfelt. Yeah, I, I think that's important to me, like my number one, I have two number one values that are really, really important. And one is authenticity and the other is integrity. Mm -hmm. So be real with who you are and, yeah. and just be honest, you know, don't, you don't have to tell people stories or overinflate yourself. That's just coming from ego. Yeah. And we need to do that. And, and that gets busted really, really fast when you Very come fast. up like that. People will pay you money and they'll go, oh, this person wasn't real with me. This is coming out now that I've given them my money. I want my money back. Yeah, that happens to people a lot. I have seen that many times on the internet. So that's, um, that's really good. And then what about for whatever you're selling? It's like, do you need some kind of hook with people? Um, I'm not even quite sure how to ask that question. Are you talking about in the conversation or just in normally talking? Well, in to the people? beginning, in the beginning, like to bring people into a conversation. It's like, how do you differentiate yourself or your business without coming across like you're coming from ego, you know, getting into that, um, getting into that first one, that validator thing. How do you, yeah, I don't even really worry about that. I'm listening most of the time. I'm listening to people's problems. And if I know that I have a solution, then I'm, I'm looking to see if there's some sort of connection or opportunity for me to invite them to explore that deeper. And that's it. I never try to sell people before I get into a conversation. That doesn't happen. I'm not going to try to convince you that my product is the best and that's why you should get on the phone with me. Okay. Um, I will just have an, an open person to person conversation. And as we're talking and you're asking about me or I'm asking about you, it seems like there's something there, then I will make an invitation. I will just take that next step. So I'm not listening and going, oh, this is somebody who I can sell to and then pouncing on them like, we need to talk because you can do this. I'm never selling people outside of a conversation. Okay. But that's I will position myself. You know, I will, whenever someone asks me about what I do, I will always tell stories about people with similar problems that I've solved. I just, I had a client one time and this was their situation and this is what we were able to do. It was crazy, but it happened. And that's pretty much it. And I, then I let them kind of ask more questions. And if, again, if they begin to ask more and the conversation starts to go long, then I, interrupt it and I segue into let's let's schedule a time to talk okay so I think what you just said is important and I'm not the expert at sales so that's why some of these questions I'm not even sure how to ask some of these questions but let me see so so you're when they ask you what do you do you don't say I teach people how to sell you don't say that you tell them well, I have a client 
so you share an experience with them rather than tell them what you do yeah that really lays it out for them and they can see they can actually see through that visual picture you're painting Yes, or I might say something like, you know how, you know, when you're talking to somebody about your business and you get to the end of the conversation and you're super scared to tell them how much it costs, right? And then I might like talk about how I solve that problem a little bit. That's it. It's just little, that's, I guess you can call those hooks, but I just tell stories because the way the human brain works is when we ask the question, what are we seeking? The yeah. answer. And the moment you give them the answer, they're no longer listening. What's your name? Shamika. And if you keep talking and I do, they're not listening anymore because they got your name. What do you do? The moment, the moment I say I teach sales and if I try to keep talking about more, I'm a sales coach. I keep talking about they're done because they I've already answered their question. That is a great tip. That yeah. is really, really good. So I like that. So tell stories. Mm -hmm. So somebody says, what do you do? It's like, well, let me give you an example. Yeah, and you don't have to say, well, let me give you an example. Just be a normal conversationalist. Okay. Be a normal person. Just tell a story. What do you do? Right? Have you ever seen, have you ever heard a kid or seen a kid on the side of the road with a lemonade stand? And you look at them and you're like, wow, that's a budding entrepreneur. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I have. What I do is I help take those types of budding entrepreneurs and actually give them step by step what they need to do to take that lemonade stand and turn it into the whatever. What's the what's the juice it up franchises of the world? You yeah. Know? Awesome. So that kind of thing. Awesome. Oh, I like that. You just helped me a lot. Thank you. <laughs> I like and that. Then the next question is always, so how do you do that? Right? Yeah. So now you've engaged a person in conversation. They're not like, so what do you do? Well, I run this organization and we teach kids entrepreneurship. Okay, thank you. Next person. So what do you do? Right? Yeah, that's right. That's good. I really like that because it makes you more interesting. Yes. And people draw more. And so then when they say, how do you do that? Okay, well, how does that work? I tell another story. Wow. I start giving client testimonials. Okay, so that works for you. It will work for me, but we have somebody here who's just starting. They may be not even clear on what business they're going to have yet. What, how, what do they need to look at in order to develop those skills to be able to do that? Well, here's the thing. If you're not at the point where you are clear what your business is going to be doing, you're not selling yet. You're not going to sell until you have a viable product. So once you have a viable product or program or service and you know what you're selling, now you can sell. Cause you can't sell nothing. You can't just say, Hey, I have ideas, right? Um, once the idea is solidified and you know, this is what my business is going to be, or this is like the area of business that I'm going into. This is the product I have an idea about. It's easy to be, to bring up stories. You can still do the same thing. Even if it's not, um, a story about a client that you've had in the past, just something that anchors in. This is why I want to do what I do. So let me give you an example. So if they say, well, how do you do that? And the same thing, you can use the, you know how, and you give them an example. So let's take a, give me a business, Julia, so we can make this concrete for everybody as an example. Okay. Um, whitewater rafting tour guide. Okay. So you know how there's people out there that love doing really adventurous things. Well, I have a company that does work. Right. Whoa, that's a tongue twister. White water rafting. <laughs> Is that fast five times? White water rafting um, tours. We take those adventurous people who maybe never done it before and we guide them through that experience so that they can have it, the ultimate experience of their life. That's awesome. And, and so, and then when somebody says to you, is it safe? Because that would be an objection they might have or a concern. And you say you don't really try to overcome objections, but how would you deal with a question like that? Um, well, if somebody were to answer, ask me something like that in the middle of like networking or something, is it safe? I mean, it's as safe as any whitewater. I mean, I would probably joke with them. Like, you know what I mean? Well, um, so I don't, here's the thing about objections. 
most people try to overcome objections or you try to prove to other people why, why they are wrong. You will likely never convince somebody that your way is better than the way that they're thinking. Right. But you can only share with them what you believe about what you do. Yeah. So I'm not really overcoming an objection. I'm just addressing a person's concern maybe, but not trying to get them to see it my way. So like I said, I might just joke about it. And if, even if I'm not a jokester, if they were to say something like, is it safe? Um, then I would say, you know, one of the things that we strive for is we strive to make sure that everybody has the best experience possible. Is there risk involved? There's always risk involved with anything, but remember we're dealing with adventurous people. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. And then I think that if you address it properly, like we, this came up in, in, uh, two of the other, uh, uh, interviews that we did these trainings for the series and, mm -hmm. and with the word we've been using this whitewater rafting example and um, and I think if you uh, deal with their objections like we were talking recently about client magnets and attraction magnets and free reports and things like that so if you did one on you know safety like mm -hmm. the three biggest safety issues yeah you know, why the, whitewater rafting is more safe than flying in an airplane. Yeah, something like that. Reasons why or whatever. Or driving yeah. your car. Safer right. than driving so have that on your website in order to keep it out of your sales conversation. If somebody asks, well, or, you know, what about safety factors? Oh, go here. I've got this great report. Yeah. I think, um, you know, one of the things that I teach about objections is, ha is not handling objections before you get people on the phone, but more positioning yourself in a way where people don't really come to you with objections. By the time they get on the phone, their desire is just to find out how you can support them and what the investment is. Really, that's it. Wow. And so, yes, we do that through education. We do that through um, positioning, like, here's my knowledge, here's my wisdom, client testimonials and case studies. Because then people don't come with these walls up to the conversation of already thinking about, you know, the fact that they don't want to buy. I mean, think about this. When you're going to shop for a new pair of jeans and you're in the, you know, store and the sales associate comes by and says, can I help you? Right? And you're looking and looking and looking. What do you say, Julia? No, I'm just looking. <laughs> and, you know, that's not true, Right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what I always say. No, I'm just looking. It's like, yeah, don't worry. You're there to buy a pair of jeans, but that is an autopilot response. Yeah. So understand this. Please listen when I say this. Understand this that most of the time, because of all of the um, stigmatism and the negativity around sales, most people in the world have auto responses to sales. So when you're in your conversations there, I can't afford it. There are all of the things we perceive as objections are really those, no, I'm just looking responses. You know, good and well, you're there to buy a pair of jeans, but without thinking about it, you go, oh no, I'm just looking. And you may be looking and can't find what you're looking for. And then you think to yourself, shoot, I should have asked them X, Y, Z, right? So if you can get that in your spirit or get that in your heart or get that in your knower, that a lot of times those objections aren't even real objections. They're just autopilot. Autopilot. Yeah, that makes sense. Defense mechanisms that just pop up. So maybe a better question for her to ask would be, or the salesperson to ask would be more direct. Like, are you finding the genes that you need, that you're looking for? And if not, can I help you locate them? Yes. If, if I were training them, I would train them to start asking that question differently because of those automated responses. But the truth is that salesperson doesn't probably doesn't really want to help anyone anyway. <laughs> She's like, I need to do this because it's part of my job. And then I'm going to go on about my business. Because yeah. if she did, she would say, can I help you find something? Yeah. Right? Oh, no, that's really true. That's really true. <laughs> yeah. She was like, don't ask me to help you. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm always like, saying I'm break it was my job. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. And the thing to think about is people react to energy, right? So if somebody comes to you, no matter what comes out of their mouth, if yeah. there's that energy behind it of like, I really don't, don't say yes, please. Yes. Just, you know, then you pick that up and that's yeah. what you tell them. And even if you wanted help, you wouldn't want it from that person. Yes. Right. Which leads me to, I'm glad you brought that up. That leads me to, to, three things that I wanted to share about why people really don't have great sales, right? 
because on the inside, on the outside, we could be saying, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. But on the inside, we're like, don't buy it. It's not ready. <laughs> don't buy it. You might not get a result. Don't buy it. I'm such a fraud. You know, all of these things are happening on the inside of us and we have to check that. And so there's a few ways to combat that. The first way, remember I said we were going to do this fun little exercise, right? Um, we're going to call it the Beyonce effect, okay? okay? So Beyonce has an alter ego, and her alter ego is Sasha Fierce. Oh. So when she's on stage shaking it, right, it's, it's Sasha Fierce. It's not Beyonce. That's right. And so you can activate 100% sales confidence before you ever pick up the phone so you don't have this don't buy from me, please buy from me on the outside going on this pool because your, your prospects on the other end can sense that. Whether or not you think they can or not, they're like, something's off, I'm not buying this, okay? So what you wanna do is think of a time, so transport yourself to a time where you felt ultimately confident. You were not second guessing yourself. You knew that you knew that you knew that you knew that you know what you're doing right? You felt good. You felt amazing. You felt like Superwoman. You felt like Spider-Man, Superman, whatever. You felt like you can conquer the world. And no one, you didn't think about asking anybody for any instructions because you just know this is how you do it. It can be anything. It can be as simple as, you know, making a decision to get married to someone. It could be as simple as um, when you get on your bike to ride, whatever that is, whatever moment or thing that you do that you just feel confident, you know it like the back of your hand, transport yourself to that moment and bring those feelings, close your eyes, do whatever you need to do. Like take yourself there until you are in this moment feeling as com confident and comfortable as you do in that moment and you stay there until it's connected. And then you make the call. That's then awesome. You do the appointment. That's awesome. I like that. It was, it reminds me of something that uh, Will Smith said when he about when he jumped out of an airplane he did his first jump and he agreed he goes like we're all sitting around together and everybody's like yeah let's do this and he's like yeah let's do this and then he gets there and he goes what am i doing here what have i gotten myself into and he said they built up all this fear and fear and fear and then they jumped and he goes in that split second when you're pushed out the door it's just bliss it, the fear just goes away and you're in total bliss because it's flying. It's just something you would never have imagined. And so he goes back to that feeling whenever he needs that to feel that like amazement with the, with the world and that bliss and that just that confidence, he goes back to that moment. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. I love doing that exercise. I do all kinds of stuff before my sales conversations. I mostly do calls. So I know some people might do in-person appointments, but I rock out to music. I do whatever, like I just get myself in a zone because I know that for me, because of what I teach, like what it can mean to somebody's life and to their legacy, it just, ch it can change their life. And so I want to make sure that I'm in the head space and the heart space where I can guide them through that decision independent of anything that's going on with me. So I'll dance around. I light candles. I do all kinds of stuff to create this atmosphere where I can anchor in my own Beyonce effect. Yeah. Um, to be able to take a stand for people to make that decision, you know, that's a yes for them to move forward towards what they say they want. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, energy is real and whatever you feel or whatever you're thinking, people pick up on that and they may not know that they're picking up on it, but yeah. subconsciously they feel that. And whatever negative thing you're thinking or feeling about yourself or the experience, they're gonna, that's what they're going to react to. Mm -hmm. So you need to like, I mean, that's such good advice to really get in the zone and really make sure your energy is as high and as positive as it can be. And you'll be ready and they'll pick up on that and they'll want to ride that wave with you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another really neat trick for the beginning of a conversation, especially if it's over the phone, guys, is to smile first yeah. and just smile. And it will automatically translate into your, your whole body will shift and your voice instead of sounding like, okay, we're here and you're going to buy from me. It's like, hey, I'm, you can't smile and not just go up, you know? How are you today? Just smile. You know, smile before you ever pick up the phone and then continue to keep that smile. 
and that smile will come across in your voice and your energy will connect with the person on the other phone. That's really, phone. isn't that amazing? Like a tiny little thing like smiling can change your whole experience. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's a good one. Any other little tips like that? Um, I think those are like the biggest ones is, you know, um, just making sure before you even get on the phone, like you feel confident, you are ready to go. Another tip, like when it comes to pricing, because I know like if you're in charge of your own pricing, it's easy for you to try to judge on the other end, whether or not somebody else can, can afford you. And you'll like find yourself reducing your pricing, raising your pricing based on what you think somebody can pay. And that's a dangerous place to be in. So have your pricing written down, including any payment plans so that you can go, okay, this is my pricing structure. I'm going to stick to it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is when it comes to objections, again, I don't believe in overcoming objections. That's a pushing kind of um, angry kind of mentality. What I believe is that you can partner with your per with the person on the other end, partner with your prospects, partner with your clients to make a decision. So instead of saying, if they say I can't afford it, or they say, what was the one you said earlier, Julia? Is it safe or anything like that? Um, instead of you going, well, you know, you're defending, you're defensive and you're defending why it's important for them to buy from you. You can say, is that important to you? Right. So now we're partnering and then now we can find out why it's important to them. Right. So we partner with them. If they say I can't afford it, it's the same thing. OK. Is it is it a yes? Like, do you do you want to be in the program as a full body? Like if money wasn't an issue, would you be in it? Because if you are, if it is, then let's talk about how we can possibly make this happen for you. Let's work it out. Would you be open to, to us kind of discussing how we can make this happen or how we can make it work? Yes. So now we're both putting our thinking brains on. They're feeling connected to you. They're feeling excited that you're taking the time to actually look at this with them, right? To explore what possibilities yeah. may be. And at that point in time, you can explore payment plans. You can explore, you know, multiple credit cards, all kinds of things with them. And independent of what the decision is, they trust you and they like you even more at this point because you took a moment to say, I hear what you're saying. I get that. And you said you wanted this. So let's look at how we can make it work. And you did that without devaluing yourself. Right. Right. Which is something that else that people pick up on. It's like, oh, wait a minute. If the person's willing to like come down in price for me, maybe they don't really value. Maybe they were just trying to get more money out of me. And then suddenly you've got this whole suspicious energy you have to deal with. So that was good. Yeah. I like and that's that. a total... It's a total fallacy to believe that if your price is lower, more people will want to buy it because more people can afford it. If people aren't going to buy from you, they're not going to buy from you no matter what the price is. Yeah, that's, I believe that too. And it's about, you get a lot of police activity in your neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, I live by a fire, uh, what do you call it? A fire department? Yeah, I live by a fire department. So yeah. there's lots of fires right here in California right now. So. I'm like, okay, and I live by the mountains. So I'm hoping I'm not about to get evacuated right now. <laughs> yeah, um, no, you're not. Um, there would be more sirens if you were. <laughs> so anyway, back to our conversation about sales. So I like that. Don't devalue yourself because then people are going to see that and they're going to go, no, that's not the person I want to work with. Mm -hmm. So just stick with your price. What about... Um, you talked about, um, you know, any kind of deals you might want to, I don't think deal was the word you used and it went right out of my head, um, plan? but payment plan. Yeah. How can we make this work or discounts? What do you, how do you feel about discounts or deals, you know, special offers? What about things like that? So I'll never use the word discount um, because it yeah. gives that effect of what you were just talking about. Like, oh, well, if you can give me a discount, then it probably wasn't worth what you were trying to charge me in the first place, right? But I will give incentives. So I will incentivize people and I give a reason for incentivizing, right? Yes, it might cut into my profit, but I want to do this. Like for me, it's I like fast action takers because I know that the fast, fast action takers are the people who in my business will get the best results. And I love having results to share with others, right? 
Because in turn for me, that means if I can share, here's what I've done with this person to turn their business around using my sales strategies, more people are going to want to buy. So it translates to more money. So when somebody is ready to make a decision that day, I will usually give them what I call a quick decision savings from making a decision that day. Um, and I already know in my mind what that would be. So you can do things like that. I give people um, savings or incentives for paying in full instead of taking a payment plan. So your payment plan might be 25% higher. If you pay in full, you might save 25% or you might save a thousand or $2,000 because you pay up front and we don't have to facilitate the payments. And I know you're all in and we can just go head on and get, get the results right away. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are, those are three different ways you can do it. So let's, let's go back through those again. So quick decision savings, um, full payment savings. And then did I give you three or two? Was it full payment? Yeah, I gave you full payment. So two. So full payment savings and quick decision savings. Okay. So one of the strategies we're using with the quick decision is uh, if they come in within this, a time that we determine, then they get grandfathered in at that price for life. Because mm -hmm. membership sites eventually raise their prices. And then if you want to stay, you pay more. So we're grandfathering people in at the at the initial price that they came in and they'll be safe from price raising. Yeah. So you can do that. So like I, we call that beta testing, like beta decision. So you're part of the beta program and you get beta pricing. So that's what we call it beta awesome. pricing. And then there's early bird pricing. Ah, and what's the difference between the two? Or so is beta is usually something that you're, it's the first time you're releasing it. Right. And so people come in and you're going to be working out bugs and tweaks and all kinds of things. So the reason why you're giving them that is that they're going to be partnering with you to make this better as time goes on as well. And they're being the first ones to come in. So you're rewarding them with that lifetime access or um, you're rewarding them with that rate being staying the same the whole entire time. So that's beta. And then early bird just means, you know, it's, it's, you're coming in earlier than the release date or the event date or whatever you're doing. So maybe we're launching it or we're releasing it in September and we're in July, right? So right. anybody who's willing to come on with us that far away, we're going to give you special pricing up until maybe August. Then the price will go up, right? Awesome. What a great idea. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. I never actually made the distinction before between, well, I never thought about the beta price. It was always the early bird. Mm -hmm. But I like that a lot. Thank you for that. And we know people love deals, right? But wow. this is a way for you to give a deal without devaluing your work or your worth or your, um, your pricing or cutting into your profits necessarily. Because you can kind of see like these people are, you're incentivizing them because they are actually supporting you. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I, I just, I can't tell you, I really appreciate you've given us some amazing information and great ideas today and really a new way to look at sales you know yeah. because I, i've been caught up before in those other the not so much the bff but the validator you know when i knew nothing about making sales i kind of went that route mm -hmm. and and the authority position, I've been moving myself into that more and more. And that's the thing about these recordings, these interviews, we're being really transparent because we're modeling. Yeah. Like we're modeling to our members the mistakes that we've made and, and then how that led to growth and why we're in the position that we're in today. So, um, so just being totally transparent. I've been there and done that and it doesn't work. It really yeah work and it's not satisfying and those are the people when you get into either that validator or bff those are the people that eventually want refunds yeah if you have to pull somebody into your into your product your course your program your services they're likely not going to be the type of clients that you want to work with yeah and and i have learned i knew a lot of people give like 30 days 60 day money back guarantees Maybe if you're selling a big, complicated program that would work, I've learned not to do that because mm -hmm. we're coaching from day one. When you come in, you're getting value, you're getting coaching. Mm -hmm. And for me to tell you, okay, you can come in and learn this. It's like you buy my product and use it for 30 days. And if you hate it, I'll give you your money back. Well, come on now. How many times do people do that? They'll get the product and they'll say, Oh, I didn't like it. They'll say, oh, is there anything left? No, you said to use it. I used it for 30 days. There's nothing left. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I want my money back. And then everybody, that's just not a satisfying kind of. I think there's two caveats to that. You know, I think guarantees work if they're done in a very powerful way. So the clarity around like, yes, use it, but this is, you have to show me proof that you've done X, Y, and Z kind of thing. Uh -huh. Because you can say that you used it, but if you didn't, right? And the other thing is standing behind your product. So if you know that within 30 days, they're going to be wild, you got to make sure you be wild people. So it's not about giving a, get a guarantee so you can just get people in the door because that's what you will attract, people that just want to get in the door and download all your stuff and then get out. So I haven't found very often that people do that um, when I do give a guarantee because I know that when they come in, they're not going to want to leave. So that's the other yeah. thing too is just really making sure that um, you can stand by your guarantee. not yeah. just anyone And that it. works because you're coming from that authority space and you're getting people in who really aren't going to be asking you for yes. it. You know, but when you're coming from the validator place, that's what I was talking about. Maybe I didn't make that clear. When yeah. you're coming from the validator place or the BFF place and you give those deals, you're going to get a lot of people coming in just for the deal. Yes. And it doesn't work. No, you know, I was just thinking, Julia, um, the reason why I didn't want to talk about like sales strategy or like sales convert, like give you the scripting or the structure of the conversation is because I think oftentimes we miss this mindset piece. Yeah. And what I found over my time of working with people, working with women, building their businesses and teaching people sales is that I can put strategy, I can map out like this is how the conversation should go. I can map out their pricing for their programs. I can map out all kinds of things for them, a strategy that can make them six figures, a million dollars. And if they don't have this mindset piece in, in check, the authority positioning, um, not thinking about yourself in the conversation, um, letting go of the outcome, all of these things, if those are not in check, none of the strategy works. Yeah. So That's this is the starting place. It's about who you are being in sales and in the conversation and you get to choose who you be. Yeah. And that's, that's where we are right now. Everybody in inside monetize your passion Academy beginners learning to do these things. We have to get the concepts down first. We have to get the mindset piece down first. And as they progress through the Academy, they're going to be ready to work with you. You know, we're going to bring them to that place where they're ready to take on coaches and work with, with you and learn about sales in a, a deeper way. Awesome. So I think it was perfect. And Shamika, thank you so much for being here today. This is such valuable information. And tell everybody where they can find you and anything else you would like us to know about you. Yeah. So the two social places that I hang out the most, I hang out on the gram. So Instagram and Facebook is my primary area. So you can just look me up there and connect with me. My website is shamikatankerson.com. I'll always be there. Um, it's been such a pleasure to be here with you guys. I am so excited for the journey that you're going on. I just want to remind you that you can do this. You absolutely can do this. Uh, being an entrepreneur is the most amazing journey. It is, um, it's tough at times. It's exhilarating at times. You're going to have so many wins, but you're also going to learn a lot about yourself. All I can tell you is this, keep going. You've got this. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we'll have the links. They'll be posted um, along with your information on the speakers page or on the guest trainers page. So okay. uh, all that will be available to everybody. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate it. And I will talk to you again soon. Thank you.